everyone. Um, I hope you had a great day, as much of a great day as I had. Um, I mean, this is my first CSS conf, which I guess makes sense because this is the first CSS conf here. Um, but uh, actually, I, I was at JSConf US, and uh, I didn't go to CSS conf US. And uh, I heard so many good things about it that I knew that when I was coming over here again to another JS conf, uh, that I would want to come to CSS conf. So I'm actually really honored that I got a chance to speak and that I got a chance to uh, talk to you guys today about the future of CSS. So the title of my talk is CSS Levels Up, and um, I searched really, really long and hard for just the right video game GIF that I could throw in here, and I just couldn't make up my mind in the end. It really, really was disappointing. Um, so just pretend in your head right now that the Final Fantasy Victory theme is playing, and anyway, okay. So that was only funny to me, but. Um, so anyway, uh, as Jed said, my name is Angelina Fabro. I work for Mozilla, and I work on the Firefox operating system. Um, I am what's called a technical evangelist, which I believe is a little bit of a misleading term. I think people assume when they hear the term evangelist that that means that we, like the people on my team, just kind of go around and just give talks like this right now, but that's actually only a small fraction of what we do. Um, most of the time, I'm actually interacting with developers like you and uh, looking at your code and helping you get your apps ready for the marketplace. Uh, I spend some time coding tools to help developers, like right now I'm working on a Ruby module that does uh, uh, JWT verification for in-app payments. And um, uh, sometimes um, we do like workshops, for example, for Firefox OS. So I do a lot of developer education as well. Um, so if anybody's interested in Firefox OS and you think you want to know what skills you need to, to work on that, you can come find me at the after party tonight, and I'll be happy to talk shop with you about that. But for now, we're going to talk about CSS. So anyway, um, last year I gave a talk at JSConf on uh, Shadow DOM, and uh, we've had lots and lots of talks uh, since then on web components, which makes me really excited because it's one of my favorite things. And when I dove into that topic, I actually knew nothing about it. So what happened was, is a few people said to me, Angelina, you know, you're good at uh, you know, communicating information, and we think that you should submit some talk proposals at some point. And I was totally terrified. And I told myself, like, OK, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick a topic that I know a little bit about, and I think it's kind of interesting. And I'm going to submit it, and like, probably it's not going to get picked. And then lo and behold, <laughs> a couple months later, somebody's like, guess what? You're going to talk at JSConf. I'm like, that's great. Oh, boy. So, I mean, I knew what you know, Shadow DOM was. It wasn't totally blind. But the first thing I did was I dove into the W3C documents and learned everything I possibly could about all of the web components stuff. I basically read those specs inside out uh, more times than I want to even tell you, because that was a lot of my Friday nights for a while. Um, and I sort of became this armchair W3C spec participant. And what that means is that I participate on some of the W3C lists that are public, and, and you can join them. Um, I, I lurk on most of them because uh, I, I only really say something when I think I have you know, something valuable to say, and I've thought about it a lot. Um, and one day, I would actually like to be someone writing those specs, so that's part of why I participate there. Um, and I mean, why do I do this? So <laughs> earlier, when uh, Nicole gave her keynote, she said, oh, I, you know, I've read some of the specs, and I don't want everyone to have to. And then I was sitting with Jed, and he and I were catching up because he wanted to know about like introducing me and like you know whether he could say embarrassing things or not. And he and he was like asking me about what I was going to talk about. And I mentioned that I would talk a little bit today about W3C process so that people understand how CSS features come into being. And I told him that one day I would like to work more on W3C specs. And he was like. Why would you want to do that? Um, so I want, I want to shape the web, right? Like, the web is where I grew up. Um, I, I think the first thing I did on the web when I was, I don't know how old was, I remember it was IRC, and then I remember being on the web, and I remember building websites with lots of animated GIFs. I, I still do that, basically. Um, and and I, I follow the W3C stuff because I want to understand what is coming. I always want to be on that bleeding edge, much like you guys. I find new things shiny and exciting. Um, and on top of that, uh, I want to be able to teach developers what is coming because those specification documents are are very, very dry sometimes, and I'll explain why that is. But first, let's talk about a little bit of a brief history of CSS. Um, I think in our industry that we have a little bit of a terminology problem, and actually not just a single terminology problem, but like a number of them. So for example, when someone asks me, you know, 
what is Web Components or what are Web Components, I'm like, well, Web Components is actually a little hat for uh, several sets of technologies like Shadow DOM, HTML imports, um, you know, maybe decorators, those are weird to me still, uh, and uh, templates and stuff like that. Uh, so Web Components doesn't refer to any single one of those things. Those are all the technologies that enables that. Uh, who, who here knows what HTML5 is? Right? Like, we've been using the term HTML5 to describe a set of technologies as well. When you see that and some, like, you know, HR person has put it on, uh, you know, like a job posting somewhere, you know that HTML5 means HTML, probably to the, you know, le you know level 5 specification or version 5 specification, but it also includes JavaScript and usually includes, uh, you know, level 3 CSS modules. It doesn't just refer to HTML5. And so CSS has a little bit of a terminology problem. Now, the first version of CSS1 was, uh, the first spec was published in 1996. It included uh, some core things like font properties, text attributes and alignment, color of text, backgrounds, uh, margin, border, padding, positioning, like basically the, the basics, right? And then CSS2, that level spec, the CSS2 level spec was published in uh, 1998, a superset of CSS1. Um, we got more positioning stuff like absolute relative fixed and uh, Z index. Uh, we got oral style sheets, bidirectional text support, media types. Um, and then people kind of thought long and hard about CSS2 and decided a lot of it was all wrong and they sort of bumped it up and it became CSS 2.1. Um, this finally became a recommendation in 2011. Uh, it fixed stuff by removing poorly implemented features from you know, CSS 1 and 2. It was iterated and tweaked for a long time because uh, it, its inception and all that was you know, well before 2011. 2011 was when it sort of got like you know, the big thumbs up. Um, but basically, it was a more solid and carefully defined specification. And then we came to CSS3, right? That's part of the, the little hat that is HTML5. Um, but it's not actually a version of CSS, um, which is pretty interesting, because everybody refers to CSS3 as like, you know, version 3 of CSS. Uh, this is when CSS was actually factored into various modules. Um, and the earliest module drafts were in 1999, and CSS had so many groups of features, they were split into modules just to make development of each set of features uh, a lot easier, rather than just put everything under one hat. Um, by June 2012, there were over 50 modules, so when you think about that scale, it makes a little bit sense to sort of compartmentalize them and modularize them a little bit. And arguably, some say CSS3 is a monolithic version, but in practice, and if you look at the docs, um, CSS3, or, or uh, pardon me, at the advent of CSS3 was when the maintainers decided that uh, we're not going to actually have like a CSS3 version, but modules themselves will sort of be individually versioned with like this leveling system, which I tell you just reminds me of video games. Um, and so in CSS3 level, uh, level 3 modules, uh, things like media queries, uh, namespaces, uh, selectors level 3, and color have official recommendations. And I'll talk a little bit about like what these recommendations mean in a moment. Um, so uh, CSS4. <laughs> This is a blog post by a gentleman named Tab Atkins, and Tab is a fantastic contributor to the W3C specifications. He does a lot of work. He's a main editor on many of them, um, a very smart guy, and he wrote this, this blog post, um, and he regularly gets people asking him, so when is CSS4 coming? And he's like, there's no such thing. There never will be a thing. We do things by modules now. And it was very funny that um, when my talk was announced for uh, you know, this conference, somebody started tweeting. They're like, well, you do know that there is no CSS4, right? And I'm like, yeah, no, I, I know that, thanks. Did you read the talk description about terminology problems? <laughs> but there's always people like that. Um, so CSS4, um, anyway, this is, CSS4 level four modules are so fresh that I, I don't actually know the dates of when most of them had inception, like they're, they're that new. Um, and uh, they level independently, uh, just like the CSS3 ones. Um, CSS4 is not a monolithic version, so uh, you know, people would argue that you shouldn't call it just CSS4, but rather refer to the status of each module individually. But fuck it, just call the collection of CSS4 modules CSS4. You know that even though we have this conversation, people are still going to refer to it as CSS4. Come on, right? Like HTML5 came to mean like JavaScript and CSS2. It's just, I, I surrender to it, and I don't know if other people are going to get angry, but I just say call it CSS4 and, and just be really specific about the module if someone wants to be picky about that. So let's talk a little bit about where CSS comes from. I'm talking about like this W3C process and these, these modules having various levels. Um, well, uh, you guys are probably familiar with who the W3C are. Does anybody here not know who W3C is? 
No hands. Okay, cool. I, I thought there might be one or two, but you know, you can never really tell the, the level of expertise of the audience, and apparently you guys are awesome. Um, so the W3C working groups spec browser tech out, and the CSS working group spec CSS out. Makes sense. So how does an idea become a feature? And what exactly is a specification in this context? So uh, specifications, like I mentioned, are particularly dry documents. And that's because specifications are not written for you, the users. They're actually written for the implementers, the people who are writing the code that makes the user agent, the browser that you're using, and it defines very carefully how the browser implementers should um, you know, implement those features so that we don't have as many headaches with things like cross-browser compatibility, and so that they are, as to say, uh, interoperable. So it's not a user manual. It's really for the programmers that are implementing the materials. Um, but that being said, you can learn a lot from reading these specifications. You can learn, basically, what the future of the, of the language features are for CSS. So the first thing that happens is, well, ideas. And did you know that there was once a spec called uh, JavaScript Style Sheets? Yeah, so this was apparently a thing. I just learned this a short while ago. It was only ever implemented in Netscape 4x. Uh, there were no selectors. You would just modify properties of the document.tags object. And so you would get something like this. And you can see that you're modifying like tags.h1.color equals blue. That would change all of the h1s in a document to blue. And all of this, interestingly enough, is inside of a style tag, or sorry, a style tag, but it's style type text JavaScript, which is pretty interesting to me. Anyway, that totally was nixed. Um, but do you also remember that scroll bar thing that IE did? It was only ever implemented in Internet Explorer circa 5.5. This one didn't actually, I think, really ever have a spec like the JSSS one did. This was just something like IE was like, hey, wouldn't it be great if users could change the default scroll bar on the window? And so you got stuff like this. I'm, I'm sorry if this is a little bit small, but you were able to specify like scroll bar highlight color, scroll bar face color. And this was uh, the point for me that when I, I was getting really into web development, I thought this was the coolest thing. Of course, you know, me being like, how old was I, like 12 or 13 or something like that? And uh, I didn't understand like, why this would be a problem for accessibility and usability. I just thought, rad, I can put colors everywhere. And uh, so you know, there it is in action in Internet Explorer. So that was like a very vendor-specific thing that did not become a feature. So I mean, it starts with ideas. And not all ideas are good ideas, right? But sometimes good ideas make it into what's called a working draft. And the working draft is uh, a snapshot of the current state of discussion around a set of features. Um, at this point, with the working draft, um, you can go to the working draft, you can see what the reflection of what people are talking about on the W3C lists, and it's sort of a codified uh, document of the things that people have been able to agree upon. And uh, not always agreed upon. There, if you go through the documents, you'll find little green areas about like, hey, this is good. You'll find little red areas like, hey, maybe we should add an example here, or this is a problem because of this other feature, or something like that. Um, and at this particular stage, with working drafts, uh, the W3C also solicits for user input. So for anything that you find in the W3C that, um, that you think is very interesting and has a working draft, you can jump on that list and you can contribute to that discussion. And so at this point, anything that's a feature in working draft stage is unstable and incomplete. So after people have bickered a lot on the internet, as one, one tends to do, um, the working draft will move into a stage called last call. And that is when the working group expresses that the draft is basically complete and all of the major issues and problems with it are resolved. And that is sort of your last chance to bring like major issues into the discussion. Like, oh no, if we implement this in a certain way, um, the Earth will explode. And hopefully you've resolved that issue so that the Earth will not explode when you try and load your web page in your browser. After that, we move to candidate recommendation. And this is actually the most important step for you, the users, because this is the step where um, the group is expressing that all the issues are resolved. And not only that, but you actually want to move into implementation. This is when browsers can actually, um, you know, browser vendors can actually say, OK, um, Shadow DOM or you know, CSS variables, now we're going to start putting this into the browser, and users are going to start testing it. So they actually start uh, implementation. Then we moved on to proposed recommendation. Uh, by this point, and after testing these features in the browser for a while, uh, there should be a comprehensive test suite developed, and the implementation should be in at least two major browsers. Pardon me, there should be at least two shipping implementations, which sort of implies major browsers. So for example, if, say, uh, Chrome and, and Firefox, or Firefox and Opera, or Safari, and you know, some pair of browsers has implemented those features, um, probably with some iteration and feedback, it, we might want to move that spec to a proposed 
proposed recommendation. And uh, the W3C members will generally review things at that point. And you might think that we're done after proposed recommendation, but no, no, there's more bureaucracy to go. So then we go to recommendation. That is the final stage. There's no more recommendations after that. This is where we say, okay, we think that this uh, document that describes how this feature should be implemented in the browser is good. We're done with it. At this point, there's uh, nothing else done except for some time, uh, there's some errata that's amended. Um, but it's also important to note that even though something becomes a recommendation, it can also become obsolete by another piece of technology or another recommendation. And this process is non-linear. Uh, for example, right now, CSS level 3 selectors are being developed alongside CSS level 4 selectors. And many CS3, CSS3 uh, level modules, CSS level 3 modules, <laughs> um, are actually like, they're, they're not near uh, their recommendation status. They're nowhere near complete. Some of them haven't even been implemented yet. So, that being said, that, now that you understand how features are made and you know that there are some CSS level 3 modules that are still percolating, I can tell you that there's actually some CSS level 4 modules. And so if we have like sort of like a timeline, uh, or not a timeline of like, you know, how far in the future things are and like you've got, um, You've got like CSS 1 and 2 are all really solid and like CSS 3 is maybe right here because like some of the modules are starting to be stand, you know, standardized and put into browsers. CSS 4 is way out here. So the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about today is stuff that uh, I've gone to the specification documents and I've pulled out. They're, they're interesting things that uh, I thought were cool to share. Um, but I wanted to look ahead a little bit further. And so my warning to you is that all of this stuff is a work in progress. Um, so you can actually go and take a look at these documents. You can go to the list and give feedback if you think that they're cool ideas or if you think they're ridiculous ideas. Like, it's OK to say, like, well, that's ridiculous. Um, it can and will change, and it will change lots. So uh, super future level four specs. Um, there is the Borders and Backgrounds Level 4 module, and there's some really cool things in there. Uh, for example, um, in addition to your uh, border radius, we're going to have something called corner shape. We'll be able to de describe a curve, a convex curve at the corner, a bevel, a diagonal slice at the corner, scoop, a concave curve at the corner, and a notch, which is a concave rectangular notch at the corner. And unfortunately, I don't have uh, photos of this because there weren't any examples in the specs, so you have to use your imagination. Um, and I think that this is particularly interesting, especially if you've seen uh, some of the stuff that Leah Veru has done with her uh, border radius talk that she gave at uh, CSS Conf um, in the US, like the the other CSS comp. Um, and I think that there's uh, some really cool opportunity there to combine things you can do with um, border radius, having additional shapes that you can do with, um, with uh, your borders now. So there's that. Um, and then we've got something called border clip, which I find a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, ridiculous, but in, in a good way. Um, and so uh, border clip, uh, sometimes you want to hide parts of a border. Um, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I mean, I actually hadn't thought about it before I saw border clip, and then I thought that it could be a really interesting, um, really interesting for people that create art in the browser and use only CSS. So it's a set of properties, border clip top, right? bottom, border clip left, and of course, naturally, just using the border, uh, border colon as a shorthand property will work like you would expect other properties to. And um, uh, it, when you're specifying uh, your units, you can also use a fraction, or FR, a fractional unit, which is a unit specified by the CSS3 specification, or sorry, CSS3 uh, grid specification. And a fractional unit is described as uh, one share of space in all the available space of an element, so it's sort of a relative unit. And um, I'm not totally 100% sure if that one's going to stay uh, as a fractional unit, because I also was reading about one called like a GR, like a, like a grid unit, so that, that's a bit ambiguous. But for our intents and purposes, we can refer to this relative fractional unit for describing this. Um, but so here's an example. Um, we have at the top there, we've described a border that's thin, solid black, so it would go all the way around the box. And then what we've done with border clip is we've said that for one fractional unit, and because only one is specified, that means the entire element, uh, we're just going to say that the border is clipped entirely. So as the comment says, that would hide the border. And then what we do is we say border clip top. Uh, we want to show exactly 10, picks, uh, 10 pixels of the black border, then fill in one fractional unit, and then 10 pixels. And that one fractional unit basically fills up all the remaining space except for the 20 pixels of, of, uh, that we've specified that we actually want to show. And so we've done the same on the top and on the bottom. In example 35, the second one there, we've uh, sort of done the same thing again. We've got border top, thin, solid black, border bottom, thin, solid black. 
And we didn't do anything to hide the borders here, but instead we just specified that we want to clip the top and the bottom, bottom after the uh, 10 pixels, uh, only 10 pixels. You end up with just a little bit of a line. But you can do more interesting things with this. So in this example here, uh, we've defined a four pixel, uh, pardon me, four, four pixel border that's also black. But then we've used uh, the fractional units to actually describe the border itself and use the, like, the absolute uh, the pixel units to describe the space in between those fractional units. And so you get something like this. And so um, the length of these border, border parts will change when the width of the element changes. So you can imagine like, you know, like expanding this, um, expanding this in some sort of like a responsive layout maybe, and then it will change accordingly. So um, and as, as it mentions there, the red there is just for illustrative purposes. It says there that you know, the browser shouldn't implement them in red. That's how specific these documents are. But I thought this was particularly interesting. I think that for people that uh, you know, spend a lot of time in CSS, you could do some creative things with this. And then also imagine combining it with um, like the, the different border, or pardon me, the different corner shapes as well. You can come up with some very interestingly shaped divs. Uh, no longer are you limited to boxes. I think we saw from the CSS animations and stuff and uh, the, the ge geometry earlier um, that that's definitely not the case today, but this opens up the door for more things. So uh, media queries level four. This is one that uh, I really like, actually. So um, there are a lot of devices now that have ambient light sensors. And what level four media queries introduces is uh, luminosity. And um, luminosity will allow you to apply styles for specific lighting conditions as reflected by the, um, the ambient light sensor on your device. So you can specify for dim, um, and dim uh, would be used for, um, you know, like nighttime. You know, there's not very much light. And so, so in that case, uh, high contrast styles would probably be fairly distracting. Uh, also for normal, you know, whatever that's going to mean. Uh, <laughs> but that's uh, ideally described as the environment where the luminosity is ideal for reading and um and it's the ideal range for the screen that you have. And then also washed, which is, of course, the, high, the, the brightest end of things. Maybe you're reading on a device in the sunlight, and, uh, of course, that washes everything out. So uh, maybe you do want high contrast in that situation. Now, I think all of this is very interesting. Um, and of course, like I say, this is well into the future. Um, uh, but you know, devices with a light sensor usually sort of auto-adjust. And it's going to be a little bit hard, I think, to uh, make assumptions across devices about like, what a good baseline is. But I think the good news is that people are thinking about this, because I really don't like it when like, my, I've got an iPhone, and I also have a Firefox OS device, and they both have ambient light sensors, and they both behave differently. And I'm just like, well. That tells me this is going to be really hard to standardize. But also, I like the idea of doing something to compensate for that change. I think that that's actually something that we should be thinking about. So, um, oh, here, just sorry, here's an example of uh, luminosity. So, for example, we could have a media query for normal luminosity, and then maybe we have like specific color of text for that. Obviously, one adjusted for um, you know, the dim and then the washed as well. So the image values and replace content module for level four, namely this is the one that I found interesting from this is actually image set. So I mean, how many people here have had to deal with multiple sets of, uh, of assets for things like retina display and for various resolutions, like basically everybody, right? Like people are already putting up their hands. Um, so this allows you to, to specify an image set and, um, and after specifying the image set, the user agent, the browser will refer to this image set and figure out for you what the best assets are to download for that, that user agent with that resolution. It sort of like takes care of some of that logic for you, which I think is a really good move forward, especially for the responsive web. Um, OK, so this one, <laughs> this one I find kind of amazing. So this one here is, is, it says element, but this is under the image specification. And this is where you're able to use an HTML element as an image. So you take, yes, yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hold on to your pants. OK, so um, I think I should crack the champagne for this one, because this is kind of my favorite, because I don't even really know what I would use it for yet. But that means that there's someone out there that will use it for something just th that's going to blow my mind. In any case, um, so how it works is, is uh, you've got element. It takes an ID selector. And in this silly example here, um, the paragraph element has been reused as a background elsewhere in the document. So you can see you've got a source element that's uh, you know, got a line background with some white text. And you've got like the destination where that uh, element is going to be reused as an image. And there it is sort of like patterned around there. So um, I can imagine like some situations where someone creates kind of like a uh, you know, like a CSS sprite, but made only of CSS. And then once it's rendered, they could then reuse that to make some pretty creative patterns. So even though at first glance, like this is a really silly example, I think that that sort of, this, this has some potential as well. 
So anyway, uh, the last one is CSS Selectors Level 4. So CSS Selectors Level 4 actually is probably the one that's been getting the most attention and it's the furthest along because it adds like uh, some selectors that uh, people have been really wanting for a while and uh, some functionality that you already find in a lot of preprocessors. So I feel like you know, the specification is sort of playing catch up um, and that preprocessors have done like a really excellent job of forging the way with what we'd call like uh, what we sometimes call like a polyfill. Like sometimes you refer to like a polyfill that is like some, you know, like some code that helps fill a feature that a browser hasn't implemented, but there's a specification for. So I would almost look at the things that preprocessors have done as polyfills, which is they went ahead and implemented stuff like CSS variables and and other um, sort of uh, logic co and combinators and stuff like that. And um, by implementing those and showing that there's demand for it, that can also inform like the direction that specifications go as well. So I haven't like the CSS uh, selection level four um, is worth, worth definitely worth a read. I've only picked like a few of the ones that I thought are useful and also in the interest of time. Uh, so uh, one of them is the um, one of them is matches. So in this particular example, like compare the top example where I've specified on each line, um, you know, uh, the anchor tag link, the hover, the visited, the focused, and then I've given them text decoration underline. With matches, I'm able to specify them and just just a, a much tidier list. Um, and I rather like that notation. I think that that's pretty fantastic. And also, I can imagine a situation where I have a div that's a header and a footer, and I just want to change the text color for those, so I might do that in that way. So I think that matches has a lot of potential. Um, not sort of ex self-explanatory. You could say that for all H1s that are not, you know, with the title class on them, everything else is red. Um, someone asked me, like, why wouldn't you want to use just an ID and make a specific rule for that? And I don't know, that's kind of up in the air for me. I got to, like, think about that one. Um, you know, doing, doing it this way, it means that uh, instead of just using, like, an ID, imagine that you wanted to have more things with, with this sort of uh, specificity of only targeting, like, one element. And then, at least with this one, you can add, like, a list of selectors to it. Um, and with an ID, you don't necessarily want to have, like, an entire you know, chain. It kind of messes. It kind of kind of adds length to your CSS file. And I'm all for writing shorter, shorter code. Um, the less code you can write to do the same job, I think, the better. So then there's the parent selector. So this one, actually, I had to think about for a little bit because I thought it was pretty interesting when I saw it. So there's, there's actually an exclamation mark in there, which I'm not sure is a really great use of notation or not really great notation, considering we also use like the important tag. I mean, ideally, you don't use it very often. But we've got the exclamation mark with the, the important tag. Um, and so uh, what's happening in the first line there is that uh, using that, um, that um, exclamation mark after the li element, it will select all list elements that are parent to an anchor tag that have the act class applied. So that's really useful for styling uh, navigation lists. I, I rather like it because I can think of times where I'm like, OK, I really want to select the parent of this one, but do I put the active class on the li or do I like move that around? And, and I, I, I like things to make sense and be orderly, and I feel like this gives me more of an opportunity to do that with like a navigation menu. And in the second situation, that one there says, select any parent of an input or an anchor tag. And so then you might change the background for those. I don't know that you'd want to do that for both inputs and anchors. This is just some arbitrary example for you to understand how it works. So, um, oh, I'm sorry that the, the blue text on that is hard to read. I should have changed that. Um, so just, just credits here. Um, there's a really great article on Smashing Magazine. Um, it's, it's called Sneak Peek into the Future, CSS Selectors Level 4. And that one talks a little bit about the ones that I've talked about and a few more. And also, there is another article on CSS for selectors. Um, if you, I, I haven't pushed these up to GitHub yet, these slides. But if you follow me on Twitter at uh, Angelina Magnum, I will do that within the next 24 hours. Because come on, guys, there's a party later. So. Um, <laughs> And uh, so polyfills, right? Like, yeah, all this stuff is totally in the future, and I told you you can't use it today, but I want you to be interested in what's coming. And if you have opinions on it, share them. Um, and polyfills, you know, gimme, 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 what can I actually use? Sorry, as far as my research has taken me, only selectors level four are really polyfilled at all. And I've found them in, um, it's hard to read there, uh, SEL is a tiny, tiny selector library, kind of like Sizzle, but they've gone ahead and implemented, um, I think, all of the level four selectors. So if you feel like you want to play with them uh, immediately, then you can go and download Cell and, um, and you can actually try that out. So um, this is also a poorly colored uh, link that says, list of mistakes in the design of CSS. So when I was reading through all of these documents, as, as one does on well, my Friday nights, um, uh, I found this document called List of Mistakes in the Design of CSS that the CSS Working Group has on their website. And there were things like, border radius should have been border corner. 
Vertical align middle should actually be text middle because it's not really in the middle. Box sizing should be border box by default. Table layout should just be sane. <laughs> So I really loved reading this list, and I wanted to include it because I want you guys to be involved and shape the web so that all of these things, you know, like, so this list stays as short as it is. It's, it's not a long list. I mean, I thought of a few things that could make it longer, but we want it to be as short as possible because we want a really nice experience for developers. We want uh, things to be nice and interoperable on the web. Um, so I want you guys to, to consider being involved in shaping the web. Um, like I said, reading the spec documents is often dry, but I can tell you that the color commentary on these lists is not boring. Um, feedback from everyday developers like you is crucial. From my participation on these lists as somebody who's not necessarily a W3C spec writer, um, I can tell you that sometimes I feel like the people writing these things are a little out of touch. And I know that they're writing for the programmers that are going to code this in the browser, but I think that they need more feedback from people like you. Um, and uh, you can join the www-style www mailing list. That's specific to CSS. But if you're interested in other things like you know, web apps and, and other technologies that have to do with the browser, then there's a list for that too. And then speak up. Don't be shy. I know you're going to go there, and you're going to think what I did, and you'll be like, oh, man, these people are so smart. They know so much about the browser. And that's, and that's fine. Maybe you don't know about all the implementation details of uh, all the things that, are, that are, go into that, but you can still give them informed op opinions about what developers are using. So anyway, that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much. I am Angelina Magnum on Twitter, and you can email me personally about any of the things that you like in the world at angelina.mozilla.com.